So I ran out of time there on the previous video, uh, but briefly I want to finish up my review of Quigley. Uh, I left off by saying that um, feudalism was the first instrument of expansion, according to Quigley, of Western civilization that then institutionalized into chivalry, a decayed and corrupt institution that fed itself on war. Uh, the nobles couldn't, um, most of them were not literate and so could not be uh, royal bureaucrats, and uh, so they supported themselves simply by going to war, and war became the stimulus for the whole economy all through most of the 14th century. So the 14th century, the period of the roughly the first hundred years war, uh, you know, Henry V's invasion of France and all of that, um, that takes place and that's the first age of conflict. So what has to happen, or what did happen in this case, is that the instrument of expansion, uh, feudalism, which had declined into chivalry, gave, was circumvented in this case by the creation of a new instrument of expansion, uh, commercial capitalism was invented. And this uh, instrument was invented, of course, uh, by the Italians. Uh, in, the in the Mediterranean in the latter half of the 15th century. So he says, uh, you know, with this creation of banks and, and the basic idea of moving money uh, through the system. And this, this type of commercial capitalism is a capitalism that's primarily based on exchange of goods. It's not yet the manufacture of goods. It's the exchange of goods because all these boats and vessels are uh, sailing around Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope, and they're going to India and where they're finding sandalwood and rosewood and silks and spices and cinnamon salt and pepper and they're bringing all this stuff back and it's stimulating the European economy which is expanding and you've got commercial capitalism which is based on exchange of pre-existing goods. And that, uh, the second age of expansion lasts roughly from 1450 to about uh, 1650, whereupon about 1650 we enter into a kind of a, a second hundred years war that lasts from roughly 1650 to 1750. And it, this is another age of conflict. Western civilization, Quigley says, during this time period stagnates. Uh, the rate of expansion of knowledge uh, is nothing during that period compared to what it was in, uh, you know, from Copernicus to Newton. Uh, there's a slowing down during that period in the rate of expansion of knowledge. And the geographic expansion is not quite the same as it was uh, with the voyages of the great Portuguese navigators uh, in the 16th century and the discoveries of the New World uh, in America. Uh, all of that kind of slows down and stagnates during that period, and so uh, commercial capitalism as the second instrument of expansion then declines into mercantilism, state mercantilism. That is circumvented then with the creation of a new instrument of expansion called industrial capitalism, and then we get the Industrial Revolution. So long about the latter half of the 18th century and lasting all the way down to about the Great Depression, we get a second age of expansion, and uh, this is the age of industrial capitalism. That fuels the whole period of expansion. In the 19th century, we get another massive explosion in the rate of acquisition of knowledge. Uh, all the great scientific achievements in technology and the sciences, uh, you know, with the birth of the telegraph and the telephone and the discovery of, uh, of uh, electricity and its harnessing and Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell with the electromagnetic spectrum and Faraday and all of its law. Oh, that great technological explosion which also occurs at the same time as a massive geographical expansion. This is, this is the period of uh, colonization, the West carving up the rest uh, and forming all these colonies. This major period of geographic expansion then uh, institutional, it becomes institutionalized into what he calls monopoly capitalism, uh, long about the time of the Great Depression. He says the Great Depression is that signaled the shift from the decline of financial capitalism where you have you know, great uh, sort of financial rich men like Rothschild um, giving way to the multinational corporation headed by men like Ford and DuPont, and this inaugurates the period of monopoly capitalism, which, by the way, is, is uh, Quigley wrote this in 1961, and you could extend that to saying that uh, the second Great Depression, which we're in right now, uh, signals the end of monopoly capitalism, its disintegration, and something new will uh, hopefully be uh, restructured out of this. But now Quigley says that we entered into an age of conflict um, starting with the First World War and all through the 20th century, we have been in an age of conflict where the rate of expansion has slowed down and we've got all this conflict going on because we've got petrifying institutions that are no longer very useful. And as a result of that, two things can happen. Now Spangler said at this point only one thing will happen because his model is deterministic. And he said that uh, what he called, what Toynbee called a time of troubles, Quigley calls it an age of conflict, and Spangler called it um, the period of the breakdown before the rise of the Caesars, he says only one thing will happen, the, the transition to a great empire, the, what he called the age of the Caesars, on the model of the breakdown of the Roman Democratic Republic 
into, through a period of civil wars that gave rise to authoritarian power and the centralization of power in one figure, by Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar. And uh, there followed, after all the chaos of a couple of centuries of civil war, a Pax Romanica under Augustus Caesar. Spangler says that is absolutely going to happen. He gave the date for it, which is interesting. He gave the date uh, as the year 2000 for the beginnings of the creation of this empire, uh, of the great universal state uh, that the West would in inevitably give rise to. And he said that um, he made a mistake, though, and it's not a mistake that Quigley makes. He made a mistake in underestimating the Americans, which are clearly America is going to fulfill this role. If anyone is going to, it's, it's obvious. Uh, but back then, uh, it wasn't so evident when Spangler was writing, and he dismissed Americans with the statement, America, dollar trappers, no past, no future. Well, the statement is actually true, uh, insofar as we are a nation of dollar trappers. What he failed to perceive was the uh, interrelationship there, morphologically, between ancient Rome and America. They're very similar types of societies. Uh, in both cases, the society is motivated by you know, military men, politicians, engineers, uh, a very pragmatic, uh, anti-metaphysical, anti-intellectual worldview, um, which is a kind of dying echo of the core world of Europe. Now, Quigley makes an interesting point. He says that all the universal states are formed out of peripheral areas in their respective societies. You get a core area. In the case of Greece, this was like uh, Athens and Sparta. And then uh, the Macedonian Empire under Alexander came out of a periphery. And then uh, the Ro Roman Empire itself came out of an area that was peripheral to that core area on the Balkan Peninsula. Uh, and then if we look back at all the civilizations, indeed we see that its final universal state does come out of the hinterland. It comes out of the periphery because the periphery is less rigidified by petrifying instruments of expansion that have become institutionalized. For example, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula with the Mayan, that's the core area of that civilization. But the Aztec Empire comes out of a peripheral area there. The, the same thing happens um, with uh, the case of Minoan Crete. Minoan Crete is a, it's its own core area of its own society, and the Mycenaean Empire that, that conquers them comes out of a periphery, what was then peripheral to the Minoan world. Um, in uh, ancient Mesopotamia, uh, he says that the final universal state of ancient Mesopotamia is the Persian Achaemenid Empire, but that's a little bit late for that. I think Qu Quigley misses that the first universal state that is created by Mesopotamia was actually Sargon of Akkad in 2350, who was the first to unify the entirety of Mesopotamia and create its first universal state. But it, these universal states in Mesopotamia were never very stable. They kept collapsing. The next one is reformed by the Babylonians under Hammurabi about 1700 BC. That collapses, and then you get the Kassites who come along and create a stable one for about three centuries. That collapses, and then along come the Assyrians, they create one, and, and then it goes on and on until you get to the Persians. And in each case, you get these empires coming out of areas that are peripheral to the original core areas of the society. And indeed, it does appear to be the case that with Europe as the core area of our Western civilization, America would, would make sense bringing a universal empire out of the periphery. Uh, America is peripheral to the core area of Europe. So it would make perfect sense, and Quigley even remarks in his book that the possibility of this age of conflict now giving rise to um, Western civilization's first universal state would likely be accomplished by the Americans. He, he has a single sentence where he says that. And so that would be the likely outcome, but he says it's not the necessary outcome. It could be the case that this current age of conflict is circumvented with the creation of a new instrument of expansion that then uh, uh, stimulates the creation of a new world and we go back to expansion again. I would, however, say that uh, there is no longer geographically any place for the society to expand to. It's already encircled the entirety of the globe, and its knowledge has encircled the globe as well. There isn't much room for any more expansion. I think we've reached the limits of the possibility of Western civilization's expansion. There's no place else to go but into outer space. And um, also, it looks like the situation that we're in now, especially with the American government, which absolutely right now, you know, the, the instrument of expansion, I would say, of America has been its government, and it, is, it has institutionalized into a military state that refuses, absolutely refuses to reform itself. And it just goes on conserving, holding on to what it has created, and it refuses to give way to anything else. And it may be the case, as I suspect, that, that America transforms into a fascist police state. We lose all of our freedoms, and a universal state begins to form out of this. And, uh, and that does seem to be happening now with these American wars in the Middle East. Uh, we're slowly seeing the creation of an American universal state out of, out of all this.
Um, so I think that's the way it's, it's most likely going to go rather than back into another age of expansion. After all, that, that back and forth modulation can't go on forever. And so uh, that's Quigley's model in a nutshell. It's not a deterministic model. I think uh, it's an interesting footnote to Toynbee, but it's kind of like a laser beam version of Toynbee. Instead of sitting here waiting through all these volumes, you, you, he distills out uh, the important points uh, into a very narrow focused uh, ribbon of ideas. So we get those seven stages, by the way, to recap them. Mixture, gestation, expansion, conflict, universal state, and then the last two stages then are decay and invasion. The period of decay in, in ancient Rome comes in around, uh, he says, around the second century AD, when Rome slowly decays, uh, it becomes absolutely petrified, and it eventually even loses the ability by the end of the fourth century to, to defend itself. And it's swamped and invaded by Germanic barbarians who come, again, out of the periphery, and a, uh, new civilizations always come from peripheral areas, and in that case, Western civilization comes out of this Germanic uh, expansion, this uh, period of what Toynbee called the Volker Wanderung, uh, of an age of epos, of epics and uh, migrations that gives rise to a new civilization, in this case, uh, Western civilization, which comes out of the periphery. And so uh, that's Carol Quigley's model, and I, I think it's a useful one. I think it's worth uh, regarding and looking at. Um, you won't find a whole lot of discussion in critical theory or in postmodern theory of works like this, which are considered old-fashioned, passe, and not worth thinking about anymore. The problem with that, though, is that the major Achilles heel of critical theory, and, um, and it's a point that was made by Peter Sloterdijk, one of its greatest exponents who's living now, is that um, it's very Eurocentric. Critical theory is extremely Eurocentric, and it's also historically short-sighted. You don't find much discussion of ancient history in uh, French Pomo philosophy. It's not there. You find Foucault's models, where he breaks Western civilization up into a series of these structural units, and then he says in the, you know, in his introduction to the archaeology of knowledge that the great historical macro narrative is dead, and now we just have these little micro narratives. But the problem with the micro narratives is that they don't look at these other civilizations. And it's almost as though there's a pretense that history doesn't exist. It's almost like we've reverted back to this Eurocentric, ancient, medieval, modern model that was already outdated with, with Spangler. So you could say that, um, in a sense, critical theory in this respect is outdated. It, it's completely, it's like the regression back to when the Greeks realized that the world was round with Eratosthenes, they figured it out. But with the bi biblical world and the rise of the Christians, they regressed back to an outmoded cosmology of the world being flat with a central mountain surrounded by cosmic spheres. That was a regression. And so in many respects, I think postmodern critical theory it, it represents a regression of, of thought and a narrowing and a very provincialization of the, uh, of the new sphere of, uh, Western, uh, of the Western mind. Uh, and so that's it.